Hi, it's Will Venus. Welcome back to my channel and to episode 2 of Cobble Icons. Today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the life and times of Vera Duckworth. If, like me, Coronation Street is right up your avenue, then I would suggest you hit subscribe so that you don't miss on any future episodes. These episodes go out weekly at half past seven at night, every Sunday, which is when Corey used to have their episode on a Sunday before they moved it to another weekday. Don't forget to ring the notification bell so that you're notified, of course, when the videos go live. Okay, so I really believe that by me doing these kind of films, I keep the spirit alive of the characters and creators that made these iconic roles. Um, because they live through us during, they live through several generations, so I feel it's very important to keep them alive, even though the characters are gone and some of the actors are gone. Although that this particular star is now on their next journey in the next realm, I want to keep, I really want to keep them alive. She, this one touched the life of so many people over the years. With these videos, I've done all the research that I can and tried to make sure to keep it as accurate as possible. Although there may be some discrepancies, but you can let me know in the comments. Okay, so this will be one of my longer episodes. So as we'll be talking about over 30 years worth of stories, I would suggest that you go get a drink, some nibbles and get comfy. Veronica, known to her friends as Vera Duckworth, made her first appearance on the 19th of August 1974 in episode 1418. Actress Elizabeth Dom went on to play the icon iconic Coronation Street character for over 34 years. Veronica Burton, as she was at birth, was born on the 3rd of September 1937 to her mother, Amy Burton, and father, Unconfirmed, which we'll talk about later on in this episode. Vera, famous for her partnership with her husband Jack, was the life and soul of the party and get-togethers at the Rovers. Her laugh could actually be heard several streets away. <laughs> yeah, her, her laugh was quite iconic, wasn't it? A loyal and trusting friend, she soon became a popular and infamous resident on the street. Although one revelation came from her possible father, Joss, who suggested that she had royal blood running through her veins, which, will, which actually went on to become a future gag with the other residents, which we'll also get onto later. Vera, known for her frizzy perm and her love of stone cladding and bingo, and her close friends would go on to appear in over 2,200 episodes spanning over nearly four decades. Now getting to the beginnings of Vera, Vera made a one-off appearance in 1974 as a warehouse worker in the Mark Britton mail order warehouse, quickly forming a friendship with Ivy Tilsley of Number 5 Coronation Street. And she was already friends with Edna G. Two years later, she returned for the full-time role and also appeared earlier in the February, just as a, or just in the background briefly, and it was a non-speaking role. She reappeared for a further two episodes in July 1976 and then returned in December on that year on a more permanent basis. Vera didn't actually become a resident of Coronation Street until, you know, actually live in the street until 1983 nine years after her original introduction and seven years after her full-time return. Getting back to the beginnings of Vera, in 1976, Vera started working at the newly built Baldwin's Casuals after Mike Baldwin had bought the site after it had been ravaged by a fire in 1975. During her time working at Baldwin's Casuals, she worked with other, other famous faces including Elsie Tanner, Ida Clough, Ernie and Emily Bishop and Shirley Armitage and of course her good friend Ivy Tilsley. She soon became an integral part of the workforce, often complaining of Mr. Baldwin's arrogant and grinding work ethic, shall we say. She, Ida and Ivy were often closer workmates during their time working at the factory as seamstresses slash machinist slash garment acre. So in predominantly denim garments, the company was actually laterally known as Baldwin's Curtains because in 1988, when Mike Baldwin found that these were cheaper to produce, uh, that's the the route that the factory went down. Off in the loud mouth of the factory, Vera was always known to mm, voice her opinions, shall we say, and her grievances, and as and when they arrived, which was often sometimes at great cost to Vera. On more than one occasion, she lost her job, but due to, like, um, insubordination, shall we say. I keep saying, shall we say, I'll stop that, because that's quite repetitive and annoying. <laughs> but she was soon reinstated when her workmates when her workmates showed solidarity and went on strike in support. Speaking of these strikes, these were actually a regular theme uh, in the days of the union. 
their union rep in particular was Ida Clough, and she was the one that was always bearing the brunt of Ida's complaints. The workforce was very much a team effort. If one of them felt hard done by, they all felt it. I thought I would do a bit of background information before Vera arrived on Britain's famous street. As I said before, she was born in September of 1937 in Manchester, UK, to mother Amy. Amy, who was played by Fanny Carby. Amy was like your your typical... She was just your typical Cory matriarch, quite stoic, quite worldly, quite to the point. Uh, Vera's husband was never good enough for Vera in Amy's eyes. Amy was always giving him a hard time. And Amy, she was quite an, an odd character herself. I mean, she was, seemed to be under the impression that another Cory resident who lodged with Emily Bishop, Percy Sugden, was trying to pursue her when he could not be able he could not be more less interested, really. And so Mrs Burton, uh, she came to live with Jack and Vera between November 1987 and March 1988. Vera's father was never truly determined, although there were a few contenders for that title, as back in the day, Amy had a few lovers around the time of Vera's conception, which is quite saucy when you consider that would have been the 1930s. No, I'm only kidding. If she, if she was a girl, she was a girl. I make no judgments, but I'm just saying other people might have made judgments for it being the 1930s. And so with Amy being a single parent work, and working as a cleaner, life would have been really hard for, for Vera in the beginning. Um, cleaners, at the best of times, they're, in my opinion, not really paid enough. And as Coronation Street always reflects real life in the show, that would have been apparent as well. And so in the times where Vera was growing up, um, the money would have been very scarce to, you know, just for those little things in life that you enjoy, you know, those little extras. Vera had her aunties, they were called Sissy and Edie, and she had her uncles, Louis, Walter and Harry. I couldn't see in the research that I did about any siblings that Vera might have had, so if anyone can let me know, please tell me in the comments. When, when Vera was 19, she might have married a man called John Harold known to his friends as Jack Duckworth. Jack was 20, but during a trip to the United States in the 90s, Jack actually confessed having lied at the wedding day about his age. What he'd done on the day of their original wedding was made a smudge on his year of birth to make it look like another number. And he said he was two years older just to try and impress Vera. And so that meant that because he'd lied about his age, they weren't actually legally married. So in the 90s, when they went to Las Vegas, they got married again in the Little White Chapel. So it's not a great start to married life when you're starting on a lie, is it? And so originally, Vera Burton married Jack Duckworth in August 1957 and then soon became the infamous Vera Duckworth. In the autumn of 1963, Vera fell pregnant and around the same time, and it's a bit like history repeating itself, like her mum, She'd had a brief affair with an unknown male and her husband, Jack, now of six years, found out about this and managed to persuade this man to leave him, uh, Vera alone by beating him up. Um, the drama unfolded was completely unbeknown to Vera and she, she, didn't, she didn't know that Jack knew about the affair, so she was just completely none the wiser. Although Jack did have his worry regarding the paternity of Terry. But, you know, as, as Terry started to grow up, it soon became clear that it was his father's son. At surface level, um, it would appear that Jack and Vera's marriage was quite unstable. They were always, you know, rowing, bickering, throwing things. And to the outside world, it appeared that they had like little trust for each other. But yet deep down, they did love each other. Like whenever someone outside of the family unit spoke ill of them or they felt attacked, ranks would be closed and they would protect each other. Their only child, Terry, was absolutely the apple of his mother's eye and later on a thorn in his father's side, to be honest. Uh, Terry could do absolutely nothing wrong in his mum's eyes. Perhaps it was like, as he was an only child, Vera kind of overcompensated for this, for not giving him any siblings. And so she wanted, she wanted nothing than to keep her son protected and happy. And I suppose this would be for any caring parent. 
So we move on to 1983, and this is the year that Jack and Vera move into Coronation Street. Jack and Vera bought number nine for £10,000, putting down a £1,000 deposit, buying it from its previous owner, Chalky Whitey. Vera, Jack and their only son Terry made quite a, a noisy start to moving in and to their life in the street. In their early days of moving in, Vera even rubs up another famous resident wrong in the form of getting into an argument with Hilda Ogden. And so with those two powerhouses having a barney, would yeah, it did cause quite a scene. And so life in the street for the duck was carried on in its usual manner. And for the next few years, actually. Uh, Vera had a job in the factory along with her work comrades. Jack had his job as a private taxi driver. And son Terry had a job in the local abattoir. Now, talking of 19, 1983, one episode that really sticks out in my mind, it's gone down in history, in the history of Coronation Street. Uh, in May 1983, Jack decided that he needed to pursue an interest in video dating, which he shouldn't really be, shouldn't have been doing at all since he was a married man. But you know, Jack is Jack, and so yeah, he pursued the interest in video dating. Now, this was all, of course, I've been on to Vera, and it wouldn't be long that she didn't she wasn't aware of it. Bet Lynch was also registered with this dating agency and in the vid and in the bid to find a suitable date and partner she went to the dating agency called Bill and Coo Dating Agency. Whilst there she was shown a video of a man called Vince St. Clair. Is this ringing any bells with anyone? Vince apparently worked in show business and was in gents outfitting and he had somewhat of a terrible mock American accent. Uh, I'm sure that there's videos here on YouTube that you can see if you just kind of search Vincent Clair or Jack Duckworth as Vincent Clair. I'm sure that you'll find it. Yeah, so the man in the chair was calling himself Vincent Clair, but it was none other, none other than Jack. And so Bet, knowing this, when she saw the video, she almost choked on the sherry that she was drinking. And with the, the women in the street kind of run the show, and so Bet felt that she couldn't keep this to herself for long. And so she told Vera, and she and Bet concocted a plan. And so Vera went along to the dating agency herself under the pseudonym Carol Monroe, and she left a message for Mr. St. Clair, and she was to meet him in the Rovers, of all places. Carol said that she was a redhead widow and could not wait to meet Vince. She was very keen. And so on the, on the, the day of the big date, Vera donned a red curly wig and quite a a slinky white dress that it, she kind of just made herself look completely unlike herself and she arranged to meet Vince in what was the snug of the Rovers. Now for those who don't know what the snug means it's a section of the pub that was kind of separate to the the general area which was dedicated for the quieter drinkers and so Vince came through the door well, Vince he came through the door of the snug and all he could see was Carol's back so he couldn't actually see the person that he was meeting. And of course, that person that he was meeting was actually Vera. When he went into the snug, he took quite a rather expensive box of chocolates that he bought earlier that day in the corner shop with him. The scene was that everyone else, apart from Jack, seemed to be in on the gag, which is quite funny. And so what he did was he tapped Carol on the shoulders, you know, just to confirm that he'd arrived. And so Vera slowly turned round, uttering the words, Well, hello, Vince. Terrific to meet you. And as soon as she said that, Jack realised the game was up and that it was her and it was all a complete prank. And so he, be he began to run out of the pub shouting, You're no flaming widow. And Vera shouting back, No, but I will be by the time I get you home. And like the clutch bag that she had, she was belting him with it belting him with the, the clutch bag on his back as he ran out and it's just one of the most hilarious scenes ever on Corey. Yeah, a scene that will never ever be forgotten in Coronation Street history. And so we move on to the year 1985. Uh, Vera's son had begun courting one of the next door neighbours neighbors at number 11. Her name was Andrea Clayton and she was the elder daughter of Harry and Connie Clayton. Uh, they'd lived on the street from January to August 1985 and 
with Terry being a bit of a the Casanova that he was and in such close close proximity to Andrea, it wasn't long before their relationship turned physical. With him being as young as they were and perhaps Andrea more so being a bit naive, uh, she soon fell pregnant. I mean, when the, the Claytons found out about Andrea's pregnancy, they decided that the best thing for her to do was to leave the street and the family didn't want Terry in, in Andrea's and the baby's life, which is a bit selfish, really, in my opinion, but that's just the way it played out. Uh, they decided that Terry was a bad influence and that, like, they really felt that Andrea deserved better. Although, from what I can recall, Terry was quite willing to be in the baby's life, but, you know, it's just the way that they played out. They didn't want anyone to know about this, and so what they did was a moonlight flip. And so Vera suddenly has her first grandchild snapped away from her, which of course left her heartbroken. Although this wouldn't be the first time that Terry would break her heart. In February 1986, Vera's grandson Paul was born, and talking a little bit more about Paul, in 1992 Vera hired a private detective to track Paul down, but Jack found out about this and he soon put a stop to the investigation by telling Vera that he'd met Harry Clayton, which is Andrea's dad. Jack said that Harry said to him that Paul had been adopted and so Vera couldn't track him down because he'd had his name changed and of course when you're adopted none of the details are given out to anyone else. So he lied to her believing that it would save Vera a lot of heartbreak. Also a quick mention around this time also um, there was another resident who would then go on to become quite famous that came to lodge with Jack and Vera. His name is Curly Watts and uh, yet yeah, Vera's Vera had her lodger in Curly, often seeing him as the son that she never had, which would repeat itself further down the line with another character, which I'll get on to later on. We move on to the late 80s, and in 1989, Vera's time as a long-serving employee of Mike Baldwin came to an end. Mike needed money from the sale of the warehouse for another project, and he sold the entire business and its space to Maurice Jones. Jones subsequently demolished the, the warehouse and all the, the offices and things, and in its place, uh, went the houses that we see now, which are on the opposite side of the, the terraced houses. And so he built things like uh, the hair salon, the three houses that are opposite the middle of the terrace houses, and what was then Mike Baldwin, Mike Baldwin's factory, Underworld, and the garage, and the cabin, and the flats above. And of course, when, it was, when this was demolished, none of the people, none of them were aware that this was happening and so Vera and her other workmates were out in the rear and so Vera had to find a new job. And it wouldn't be long before finding a new career in newly featured supermarket Better Buys. Anyone remember that? Yeah, some of my favourite scenes are from Better Buys. And yes, yeah, so she and Ivy found employment there, enjoying each other's company as, as colleagues, you know, just to get them through the monotonous days and shifts and endless shelf stacking and working at the tills. Also in 1989 is when another kind of coy landmark happened. Vera decided that to improve the property value of number nine, that she would get stone cladding put on. Now, I really like it. I'll, I'll put a picture here. I really like it, but it didn't really go down well with the other residents. Yeah, let's just say that they were less than impressed. And so we now move on to the 90s. And in 1991, uh, Vera's mother, Amy, passes away. And Vera's left devastated again. And devastation is like a regular theme for Vera. It's quite, it's quite sad, really. But the funeral soon turns into a revelation because a man called Joss Shackleton comes over to her and like after a brief meeting and you know exchanging kind of pleasantries as you do at funerals he soon tells Vera that he is actually the father that she never knew and the father that she'd always wanted to meet. It explains that he couldn't really introduce himself as her father when she was growing up because because he didn't really want to upset Amy's life so that's why he stayed away and so with Amy gone he felt free to tell her who he truly was. I mean when Jack found out about this he was his usual skeptical self not believing him thought it was a bit of a 
a freeloader really, and a bit of an eccentric. But Vera truly believed that he was her dad. But this wasn't the only revelation that uh, Joss had for Vera. Joss went on to tell her that his father was actually the illegitimate grandson of King Edward VII. And so Vera believed herself to be the second cousin once removed of Queen Elizabeth II. And so when she found out about this possible royal connection, Vera kind of said that she always knew there was something different about her. Um, and she just fully accepted that she had royal blood running through her. And this was to go on to be like a running joke theme throughout her time in the street. Although it wasn't um, necessarily a joke to her, it was more like a, a joke between the other residents and the viewers. And so much so that she would actually send birthday cards to the royals on their birthdays. Yeah, so getting back to Joss, um, Vera's husband Jack always constantly tried to prove that Joss was like a freeloader and he felt that he was pretending to be her dad for some odd reason as a way of staying connected to her. And like I said, going with the theme of grief and devastation, Joss died two years later on the 8th of November 1993. Vera, <laughs> bless her, she actually wrote to the Queen to inform her of her cousin's passing. And, and as Joss hadn't left any, you know, like insurance policies, she told the Queen that, <laughs> this is really sweet, isn't it? She told the Queen that she'd paid for her dad's funeral out of her bin bingo with. Such a sweet story that, isn't it? His flat didn't contain any letters from the royals, but an ashtray inscribed present from Windsor Castle and an old pot dog, which Vera took home with her. Uh, she did feel... She did feel that this validated her royal connections and it was also a comfort to her. And so we move on to slightly better times. And so we move on to some better times. Oh, and some sad notes as well. In 1995, Jack's brother Clifford passes away after he and his wife Elsie are killed in a car crash whilst holidaying in Malaga. Now, the news reached them when Jack read it in the newspaper. No one thought to tell him, either in person or on the phone, leaving Jack very upset, of course. Even more upset when Cliff's solicitor called him into the office. Uh, Jack believed that he was to be responsible for Cliff's debts, so you can imagine their shock when they found out that they were the beneficiaries of £30,000 from holiday insurance. Uh, although for Vera this was bittersweet because she had recently prayed for some money to be sent their way and was kind of riddled with guilt because she believed that she was responsible for their death by praying for money, which of course isn't true. And, of course, <laughs> things soon move on, the guilt passes, and she, so she soon realised that she wasn't responsible, and they soon began to make plans for, for what they would do with her windfall. Now, in October of that year, uh, they were soon to make their new investment, uh, arguably one of, their more defining, one of the most defining moments of their lives. Um, landlady of the Rovers, Beck Gilroy, couldn't afford to raise the money to purchase the Rovers at the brewery, as the brewery Newton and Ridley decided that they needed to sell the pub. Beck couldn't afford the tenancy, and after an argument with Rita, you know, the famous argument in the cavern, pals, pals, uh, she left defeated. And so, enter the new landlord and landlady of the Rovers, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Duckworth. Veronica Duckworth, licensee plaque was placed above the, the two green doors, and their tenure began in the Rovers. Vera's ultimate dream was to have a pub of her own and when her dream came true of course she was completely over the moon. It first appeared that Jack and Vera were running the pub very well, uh, so well that they actually stayed there for four years but as things never go to plan in Soapland uh, this tenure didn't last forever. So they discovered that they hadn't been doing their taxes properly and were slammed with a huge bill from the inland revenue, as it was known back then, for a whopping £17,000. So with little option that they had, they had to sell and Alec Gilra was the person to buy them out. And their time as landlord and landlady came to an end, which was quite, yeah, quite sorrowful for Vera in particular because she felt that it was like a bit like going back rather than going forward. And so in the time between Working at Better Buys and buying the Rovers, Terry had came like in and out of Vera's life periodically. And Terry had a son called Tommy with a woman called Lisa Horton, who later became Lisa Duckworth. And around the same time, Terry went to prison for GBH in 1992. And so when Vera's daughter-in-law was 
killed in a motor accident and baby Tommy was left, well, pretty much parentless because his dad was in prison, his mum had passed away and so the only people that could look after him was Jack and Vera. Uh, they didn't have any financial support from anyone and bearing in mind Vera wasn't really going to her job in Better Buys because she had to spend a lot of her time looking after Tommy so, you know, money was really, really tight. And when Terry did eventually come out of prison, he soon showed his complete disregard for his parents and showed what his true, true love lay in the form of money. It actually colluded with Lisa's parents, the Hortons, and for a sum of money, he agreed to give custody of Tommy to them. If it couldn't get, if you think it couldn't get any crueler, then it did. And on Christmas Eve of 1993, there was the very poignant scene when he told Vera that Tommy had been, I suppose, given to the Hortons, and Vera ran out in, uh, into the street checked to see if Tommy was in the car. It wasn't. The Hortons drove away and Vera was, like, it was a really poignant scene actually because it was at the end of this particular episode and Vera was seen to sob into little Tommy's clothes and his toys and things. And that's a scene that really, it really doesn't sit well with me even to this day. It really upsets me because although it is a fictional character, you learn to love these characters and to see this particular character that I really loved upset, it, it was just it was just so appalling for her. And so we now move on to the later 90s and with Jack and Vera needing a new home since they were out of the Rovers, um, they had to search for that and this was to come in the form of a boarding house. Um, they moved into a guest house which was actually owned by Eunice G and that was the, the former wife of Fred G. Remember Fred G that worked in the Rovers? Quite a, a tall guy, bridged glasses, quite sarcastic, and I wasn't keen on the character, put it that way. So, yeah, Fred's ex wife. And so, yeah, they lived there for a little while with Eunice, and when Eunice emigrated to Spain, she left her guest house in the hands of Jack and Vera, um, which they again seemed to take to quite well. And so, towards the end of the 90s and getting into the, into the 2000s, which was a time when Vera was, say, getting into her more mature years. Uh, she felt she needed to kind of slow down the pace of life a little. And she soon began employment with Roy's Rolls, which is now located in the Victoria Street, where it used to be in Rosamond Street. You remember that? Uh, there she served all the residents, you know, all the cafe treats like tea, coffee, and, you know, their breakfasts and lunches and things. Um, and, I, and I, I remember when Vera had this scene and it was with a character called Frankie Baldwin, which was Danny Baldwin's wife, and Danny turned out to be Mike Baldwin's son. Frankie, who was played by Deborah Stevenson, an actor that I love. It's, I mean, for Corey and Bad Girls, remember, but anyway, different show. <laughs> um, Frankie asked Vera if Vera could cook, and Vera turned around and says, Can I cook? My cauliflower cheese is famous, Randy, you know. <laughs> and that, that, I don't know why, but that really makes me laugh. Uh, it's really funny. For, for whatever geeky reason that is. And around about this time, like in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had developed like a motherly love for another, like a young boy that was a bit unloved and unwanted, and his name was Tyrone Dobbs. And Tyrone Dobbs is still there to this day. Um... Another another young lad that she would quite happily class as one of her own. Uh, he really, in my opinion, treated her like like the way that she should have been treated by her own son. And so when Gary Mallet decided to sell off his home, now Gary Mallet had bought number nine from Jack and Vera in 1995. He decided to sell up that home and move to Blackpool with his twins because... He'd lost his wife, Judy, to a brain aneurysm and decided that he needed a new start. And so Jack and Vera bought number nine back from him. And because Jack had recently won over £60,000 betting on a succession of horses, they had the money to do it. And so they moved back into number nine, taking in, taking in lo uh, Lodger Tyrone with them. Now, around about, I think it was late 2000, uh, 
Andrea Clayton. You remember Andrea, who I said that she had baby Paul with? She came back and they came, she came to see the duck horse uh, to tell them that their only grandson, Paul, really needed a, a kidney transplant. Uh, Jack and Peter were both tested uh, to be donors because they just wanted to help all they could because they'd not seen Paul for years and years and years and thought that, you know, they would just do anything to try and help him in any way that they could. And so they were both tested and Vera was in fact a match. But with Jack considering all the, you know, like the serious implications that transplant surgery could have, he didn't really want her to do it, especially being, you know, in her more, her senior years. And at the same time, Terry was finally contacted and persuaded, of course, financially to take the tests and he was a match too but with Jack not really wanting Vera to have the operation he offered Terry £25,000 to for Terry to get the operation done but but Terry being his usual cowardish self um, he nearly did it but balled out at the last minute and he took the money with him. Coward. And so shortly after Vera was she went into surgery had the transplant and it was successful but Although the transplant was successful for Paul, Vera soon developed complications and nearly died. And while Jack was waiting to see if she'd recovered, he found a note from her and it, that she'd left him. And it was like a note sort of just in case. And in it she confessed that, remember I said before when Jack had knew all about the affair that she'd had around the time of Terry's conception, that he'd found out about that but not really let on to her. Well, she, she was like pouring her heart into him, to him in this letter and telling him that Terry might not be Jack's son, but later on Jack told Curly that he was sure that Terry was him because Terry was so much like him. Although Jack, I would say, was a better person than Terry turned out to be. He later pretended to Vera that he'd never read the, the note because he was positive that she would survive, so there was no way that he was reading the letter because she was going to live. But it just goes to show you how much he did actually care for her, despite his usual, you know, bravado and moaning and like, oh, my life. Millstone Remanek. Uh, yeah, it just goes to show that he did actually care about Vera. And these episodes relating to the transplant were actually dedicated to the street's 40th anniversary and they were actually filmed live, some of them. And I remember watching an interview that Liz Dawn did and she said well all she had to do was lie there and do nothing and she fell asleep which is hilarious when you're filming something that's going out live to millions of people and I believe that Prince Charles actually visited the set as well and so this was the first live episode that Corey had done ever since the early days in the 1960s, because in the 1960s, um, Corey was actually filmed live. So as it was filmed, it was going out live to viewers on their TVs. Okay, what I'm gonna do is stop this episode here because I realize that um, I'm a little bit pushed for time because I don't like to keep these episodes going for too long. So what I'm going to do is uh, finish this here for now and I will have episode and then I will have part two of this out for you tomorrow. Is that all right? So if you want to see part two of this, make sure that you're subscribed so that you don't miss out. And I shall see you tomorrow. Yeah? Tarachok.